uh, collection of the data, accessibility of the data. One term that I really liked uh, was mentioned by the representative of UNICEF, or uh, no, one of the panelists, uh, I can't remember who it was, accessibility of understandable data. So you might actually have, you know, free uh, geospatial data, but what you can do with that data based on your knowledge, your expertise, that's a whole different question. So how to really bring some sort of data in a format that is possible to use, how to keep it sustainable. There are a lot of issues around that. So this session is concentrated on uh, the aspect of data from the very macro level, governing to uh, statistics and uh, basically uh, downscaling um, and also looking at uh, the local works, what can be done on the ground uh, from the community sphere um, uh, for basically collection of the data. So um, I'm gonna just have a little bit of a shift uh, in terms of the presentation order. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Sirapon uh, from a statistic division uh, of ESCA uh, to share a little bit of insight on uh, disaster risk, uh, disaster related statistics in CCA and uh, DRR and how his work uh, and ESCA's work is actually uh, hoping to get connected to this topic. Uh, please, uh, you can you can share your uh, screen and your slides. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, it's loud and clear. Right, so let me share my screen and it's a privilege to, to be joining this workshop. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, but really like me next week or uh, next month or so, I would be in Mali again, uh, working with uh, this agency on improving disaster statistics. Uh, so my presentation today will focus on I think part of the issues that you already have discussed so far uh, on integration and coherence. That will be the theme of my presentation. Uh, could someone confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Right, okay. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll spend around 10 minutes or so, uh, and, and then maybe if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer. Let's start with, the problem first. Uh, when when we start thinking of of the sustainable development of country, now we know that the decisions are not siloed. We know that they are more integrated than than we thought. Uh, when we think of uh, whether we want more water, we want we want uh, better energy mix, or we want food and want better jobs, we want uh, to close gender gaps. We also want to conserve our ecosystem. We also want increased reserve income. Uh, all of these important policy uh, discussions are actually integrated. One thing cannot be decided if you think about it by leaving other considerations uh, 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 apart, right? So that, for example, the decision on development and conservation. So uh, we also like continue like a Maldives. We know we know that the, the national income come from come from the the uniqueness of the country and the pristine uh, oceans and and ecosystems. And some on the other hand, we also need to develop the country. Uh, so the question would be where to develop. How do we uh, be how, how do we make a decision that would also benefit uh, these two dimensions? And is is it for the short term benefits or is it for the long term benefits? And who benefits anyway? Are we talking about our uh, great grandchildren or or the foreign investors or international partners. So I, I think this is this this information and and discussion becoming very integrated when we when we started to thinking about it. Uh, when it comes to disaster and climate change, uh, data and statistics about these two topics, uh, Maldives is not an exception. Uh, produced by many agencies in the in the national statistical system. So by definition, they are very fragmented. There, do, there might be a lot of data out there if you started to ask your, your colleagues in different agencies, uh, but they might be collected in the different ways. Uh, they might not be able to be compared because it was collected by different uh, staff. 
uh, doesn't follow the same way of doing things. Uh, instead of having information that could guide us uh, in sh in shaping our discussion, it become uh, uh, information that might not be able to be used at all. Um, and if we think of the the, the entire uh, country's uh, social system, I think we are we are more used to in producing economic and social statistics, much less so on disaster stats. Well, even more so on climate change related statistics. So this uh, once once we have information that's supposed to guide our our decision uh, in a fragmented manner, uh, did actually undermines the way of our integrated decision making. Um, so one 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 thing that I have observed in uh, in working with many countries is that when we think of disaster and climate change statistics, we need to work with official statistics. We need we need policy uh, makers to be part of the conversation. And also equally importantly, we need scientific uh, community to, to be able to provide important insights. But these three groups of, of, of uh, uh, people might not be working together and, and they, there might be some in some block in the communication. For, for instance, if if the policy people ask, what data do you have? Then uh, official statistics people might ask, what data do you want? And I, I have been in this conversation a lot. Uh, what do you have? What do you want? And then we have a, a, a third group say, OK, what do you need to know? I can produce anything that you like. So with this this kind of, of conversation, conversation is not guiding towards working together. Um, and if that situation happens, we would end up with uh, so-called the data graph, yeah, that a lot of data are produced and collected, but they're not get used. So we have uh, a lot of, of uh, data sitting in, in, in agencies, but they were been able to use to guide on policies. And we might end up even more severely, uh, very confused uh, decision making uh, processes that are not guided by evidence, or we might have very excellent uh, scientific knowledge and products that are left in the ivory tower and will be used because they're not responding to, to specific policy demand. So we, what, what we want to do is is to break this wall, right? We want we want this group to think and work together differently. Uh, maybe instead of asking. Uh, what data do you have? Maybe we first people may, may say this is our national vision. This is our priority. We know that this is the way Maldives have to go forward, but we have a lot of challenges. How do we solve the problem? What kind of data that can guide us? Now, in Office of Statistics might say, how can we help? Uh, we have a lot of, of data that we collected. Maybe we can adjust and, and repurpose some of, of our data collection schemes to answer important policy questions. And scientific community could also uh, starting linking that uh, uh, scientific research towards more evident uh, informed kind of action. Uh, so this once once we we have this this uh, conversation towards um, uh, coherence in in the collaboration that might be helping in solving the problems of of integrated decision that we actually face. Um, so where to start it if we. We, we know the problem, we know kind of way to, to solve it. Um, if you think of the climate change uh, and we, we know that is is a global issue and the way to solve global issues is, is, is through the international actions. So it cannot be one country doing on its own without uh, collaborating with other countries. The means towards supporting international actions would be the evidence that are concrete. Uh, they, are multi, they should be multidimensional and they should be internationally comparable. And, and this, these three terms are important. If, we, if different countries uh, start working on a set of information that are uh, internationally comparable, they look at different dimensions of disaster and climate change, there would be a chance that we can pull all the information together and we can work as a global citizen. So when, when we're talking about multi-dimensional, we're talking about drivers and impact of climate change, it in, includes climate-induced disasters. 
uh, I, I understand that uh, just a month ago or two months ago, there was a, a flood uh, happening in Mali. Uh, so that, that, that should be uh, also re recorded in terms of, of the events and, and the amount of impact in an internationally comparable uh, manner. We are talking about population, social, environmental, economic vulnerabilities. Um, mitigate, uh, information or evidence that would inform mitigation and adaptation measures uh, or the social economic implications of climate policies uh, to ensure just transition uh, towards the net zero and low emission economies. I heard that we there was already discussion on on mainstreaming gender, right? How how do we ensure that once the, we move uh, our country towards uh, low emission economy? Uh, we don't end up with the, the energy poverty or, or further urban rural divide, or we have further or widening gender gaps, or we have more impact in specific employment categories when we shift our economies to to net zero uh, society. So th these things are then multidimensional and they are connected. Uh, that's why when we we are we are looking at evidence. Uh, it, we have to think more than one angle, and and that there, there are a lot of guidance out there that can help us. Um, so that always some good news, right? So you we we are not alone. This issue of of uh, climate induced disaster, the need for better adapting to climate change and uh, mitigate the impact is the global relevance. So that there, there are a lot of uh, good practices and experience that. For instance, in, in this particular project uh, under this uh, that uh, under which this workshop is uh, supported, uh, is cooperation between SCAP and and UNDP, and we we can further sharing experience and, and practices from other countries in this area. Um, I talk a lot about uh, the importance of international comparable data, and uh, in in that sense, there are a lot of tools that we we. We have and and has been actually used, including in the Maldives. We're talking about the global set of climate change related statistics, the disaster related statistics framework. We have, uh, for example, the national national account system, uh, the SIA that uh, uh, is already known in in the Maldives. Uh, that it is an international recommendation of energy statistics and a lot more uh, guidance and and tools that we can utilize. And ensuring uh, international comparable um, climate related information. Um, in including the Maldives, when I work with many countries, I noticed that there are actually a lot of data already there. Um, and you might not uh, think about utilizing these data sets uh, when, we, when we think. Uh, Specifically on either disaster or climate change, but these are really relevant. Uh, country has has the population census that would give us the the important uh, breakdown in terms of where people live uh, and and the growth of population in different part of atolls. These are very important because this 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 data would inform us on on the population exposure, including some infrastructure. We have the CRVS system that may provide more time information as births and deaths happen in the country. This this number will be adjusted daily, uh, so we give a timely information on the population dynamics. Now, in, on economic side, we also have business register, economic surveys. Country has done uh, GDP uh, compilation. That's that's input output table. We we have we also have other uh, kind of surveys. Uh, we see accounts has been piloted in the Maldives. Um, that also spe special data, few monetary data we can make use of, and also importantly, uh, administrative data sources, including the disaster databases. I believe that the DMA is is also uh, reviving and and creating uh, a new economic loss portal. Uh, I, I I would be. Uh, uh, from SCAP side, supporting the enhanced uh, quality of the statistics before uh, they get into this database. And also, I just want to emphasize that every country has an NSO. Uh, in case of Maldives, would be the, the Maldives Bureau of Statistics. Uh, 
uh, this knowledge is already there in, in, in the system. Uh, the, the, I think what, what we should uh, consider is how we work together as a system, uh, this, uh, answering key policy questions uh, when it comes to disaster and different dimensions of climate change, uh, building on existing data that we have, filling the gaps when we see them. Uh, that would be a good way of mobilizing financing and resources, uh, consider considering uh, the other constraints that we, we have in the country. So that 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 would be some of the things that SCAP will continue working with the Maldives going forward. Uh, particularly, uh, I'm sure Farusha uh, from the disaster management agency is in the room, but that is something we we will continue to discuss and and support at least. Uh, to see the improved uh, data behind uh, the country's the disaster database. So thank you very much uh, uh, in brief, and if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, uh, to your point. Any question from the uh, colleagues here? Anyone? Okay, so he's got to be in Maldives. Uh, did I understand it correctly next week? Oh, sorry, ne next month I'll be there. Next month. So if anybody, any of the organizations are interested in working with the statistic division from a SCAP on potential work, then he's the person to get in touch to <laughs> a bit uh, from this point on. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's go to the next presentation. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Mohafer. Uh, from uh, acting to uh, give us the presentation related to data governance. Um, Thank you. I think I hear me well, right? Yes. Or maybe online, it's okay if I speak uh, about Let me check from the friends online. Uh, so actually, can you tell me, can you speak a little bit? <laughs> My voice is so loud, of course they can hear. <laughs> you are not the correct <laughs> yes. Can I be heard well, colleagues online? Or oh, anybody? So actually, can anybody? you hear? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be back again. Uh, following our discussion also this morning, I think uh, that was really very good. The panel that we have on translating the RRCCA to the planning developer. So I think some of the points probably can be connected to the issue that I'm raising here. And uh, that's actually about the data governance of how it is done for the disaster reduction, some observations, thoughts, and also uh, some outcome of the joint uh, project that Alpine and UN Europe, see how all this year, well represented. Anybody else from UN Europe? Uh, we had a joint project, and uh, about four more than four tech companies actually were also looked at. Uh, as I was mentioning this morning, if we go to delve and go to the depths of the governance of policy issues, we want to the very nice, catchy term so everybody can use it. What we saw this morning that uh, it really needs a bit of uh, exploration going inside. Okay. Um, I think uh, Leno can take care of this slides. If you oh, I forgot, I forgot. <laughs> I got so excited to look at the book. No, no, no. Some uh, issues, I think, and the topics for consideration analysis that uh, have been captured throughout the work that we have done and also reflected punctually this morning in our panel. And the data availability and sharing, I think you remember. This morning, that it was free from the national presentation uh, or words of the cabinet, actually. And then uh, this must be deconstructed and we go inside it. When we talk about the data, then what type of data? We 
it's so that and mentioned that that's what currently it's hugely about hazards. And we need to expand it and to enrich the available data on the hazards to become risk data. And then risk data is about adding the information that's on the vulnerabilities and exposure. And then vulnerabilities, if we go further, it is in different categories. We have physical vulnerabilities, like the uh, building uh, safety, like infrastructure, roads, transportation, etc. Et and then we have social vulnerabilities, like the migration from rural areas to the urban areas and formation of informal settlements. The slum that increases uh, hugely the vulnerability and other types of social vulnerability. The third category is economic vulnerability, the poverty, and then uh, lack of investment in safe construction, and insurance, etc., etc. And then the fourth type of vulnerability, which is uh, environmental vulnerability, we are very well aware of it in Maldives here. So uh, then vulnerability even has several categories, and then there we go to the cross sectors, infrastructure, economic, and social. Uh, and then exposure, not land use management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about the data availability, it is first to uh, uh, qualify and improve the, the content of the data. When we did it, then we come to this availability, whether it's available or not, which is the case in many countries. So uh, there is no problem absolutely about the uh, sufficiency of the um, uh, availability of the data in the first place. The question is how we can use it effectively and how they can be complemented. And then the question of the sharing. I know you have been involved in it a lot, the, the process in the country. So uh, what, what, what is the national protocol? I mean, in Iran, for example, we help the government to receive a high resolution satellite imageries for the floods in two cases. Uh, and it was done very effectively, provided. But then what, what happened next? So this uh, satellite imageries and formation it's very precious, very valuable, but how it can be used. It cannot be used right away by the disaster management organizations. They need to be processed. And then they came to the question, what is the national protocol or the plan to receive, process, and then use the data? So on the data availability and sharing, there are a lot of uh, policy questions, there are a lot of structural questions, there are a lot of Content questions: How we can convert hazard data to uh, risk data, and then the customization. So, as experts of disaster management, for example, we know very well generally. But if we want to convince a, a decision maker in the Ministry of Planning or Economic Affairs or in construction, uh, these uh, sort of specialized hazard and uh, vulnerability. Uh, data must be customized in the language of the audience or the target group so they can see. When we talk with the economist, then we show the uh, loss and damage impact on the development of the socioeconomic development. Or we show the value of the uh, risk reduction and prevention. So the figures, and then we are talking about the impact. I personally think that if we cannot show the final positive impact or the negative impact of doing or not doing disaster reduction prevention, it will be very difficult to reach the point we can do it very well. We can get good results from our projects after one year, two years. Nice. But what is the change at the end? The people like? Not sure. So, therefore, I think from the beginning. So, here we come to the policy laws and regulations. If this is the gap which was confirmed this morning in our panel, then we need the policy. Okay, we, we, I talked briefly about the concept of policy. The policy is not a national framework or a statement to how much time do we have to be online. So what time did we start here? Uh, it's it's eight eight eight. Eight.
I mean, overall, like maybe 15 minutes? 15 minutes, you know, maybe sure, uh, less, actually. Just one out, not to go beyond like uh, actually assigned time. So the policy, uh, again, is not high level strategic political make a statement, papers ratified, etc. In the new definition of policy, especially public policy, they say that the policymaker responsible to review the proposed solutions by the scientific communities, technical experts, and then choose the best solution which fits into the country's ability long term development plans. This is the first step. Second, then they chose the solutions and selected. The more important job actually is to roll out, disseminate it, and create consensus and agreement in the country and community about those solutions. So, for example, in the Maldives, the desirable situation is that the person who is in the remotest island and very, very executive not related to policy could have the same level of understanding of Maldives climate change solution as the Minister of Environment and Climate or other authorities have. Otherwise, policy will be just a paper in terms. And then laws and regulations. So laws usually is coming. This is a very interesting concept of stimulating disaster management law. Uh, laws and legal solutions are usually the minimalist sort of approach. So they show the red line, the minimum. But for development, we need a maximalist approach. So if we focus on the law, we will not get anywhere. We just protect ourselves not to be put in jail or prosecuted. <laughs> that's that's I think the result. Therefore, the minimum is law, the maximum is the development plan. And what is the defining law actually the policy tells us what type of laws actually can help us to connect with the long-term objectives. And then regulation of home work. So the question on the Policies and minimalist law actually is another issue. Investment and budgeting, I think it has been mentioned a lot. Uh, that, that's actually uh, another uh, important actually dimension. Again, for the macro policy makers, it's important to see a percentage of the national budget, annual budget will yield or result in how much actually uh, outcome in five years, 10 years, in economic terms. Uh, so here, I think the investment must be qualified with the very sort of concrete calculations. Now, globally, we say that $1 investment in disaster risk reduction will result in uh, how much saving? Some time ago, it was about seven. Now, Harold can tell us how much. $10. Now, in recovery, it's about $15. And economists like Leila will get it immediately. Yes, if I put $1 in the uh, prevention or risk reduction, I will save actually $15 for the responsible recovery. I think that's, that's understandable. But if we show 200 seismic and meteorological maps to the, the director of Ministry of Finance or Economic Affairs, so that is nice, but what, what should I do about it? Uh, and then national and subnational capacity, administrative capacity, the financial capacity, technical capacity, these are all mentioned by here also from this morning session. Don't go through that. Next slide, please. So all this academy interface, I think it was also mentioned this morning. Uh, we have a general Nexus uh, model, and that's science policy action. That's critical. So policy academia or science is one part of this Nexus. But what is the link to the executive bodies in the material organization? Again, solutions should be proposed by scientific technical communities. Solution must be selected, chosen by the policymakers, and then rolled out, create agreement, and then these solutions must be implemented or uh, done by the executive bodies, and then they give the result of evaluation to the policymakers to correct the policies if it has a problem. If the policy was okay, problem is the scientific technical community, then they send it back to the academy and say that 
the solution that you provided actually doesn't help us. So this cycle, I think, is, is very important. Private public interface, I think that's that's very clear. I don't uh, spend time on it. Early warning system, of course, it has boundaries and international cooperation is there. There are some sharp things among these actually titles like transboundary risk and international cooperation, but but generally these are the eight headings. So that uh, could be considered as the chapters for a data. So if you want to develop actually a data governance and policy design, uh, there might be also other issues, but the main categories could be probably class policies. Uh, there are a number of examples, to, just to be concrete. I mean, this joint study review more than 10 countries, but uh, we, we can look at the different dimensions when we go to the concrete cases, like in Nepal, actually. There is integrated and comprehensive disaster information management system, which is established by the government and the Ministry of Home Affairs and currently owned by the National Disaster Reduction Management Authority. In 2019, it's an open platform to gather information from different departments, such as the Hydro Met Office, the Forest Fire Department, Geological Department, is also an optimal approach. The disaster data sharing by enhancing all the phases of the disaster management cycle and facilitating disaster communication, of course, disaster coordination. I suggest also if you're interested to review the NIMPO National Disaster Reduction Framework. Some time back for Iran, I did two reviews, one Australia, one NIMPO. Uh, so you can you can see the similarity differences. Australia copy exactly the structure of the standard framework in terms of its priorities for action, targets, et cetera, et cetera. Nepal is a little bit different, and that framework can tell us where Nepal is going to be. Why? But that's a fundamental discussion. And then when it comes to the data governance and policies, we can see that this structure traces back to that framework, but that's the sort of foundation for, for the work. And this is available just for you if you want to, if you haven't seen it yet, you can look it online and then see how in the politics. Next one, please. So similar in Indonesia, just another example. It's a different context, a little bit that you are aware on the humanitarian open street map team, actually will be BBB, Dito Jakarta. And then they actually uh, the flood map for the period 20 so January to February 2014 was there, and then Developed, developed, developed. Uh, the maps which are there in the Indonesia case is one of the very interesting cases. I mean, initially they start from 2004 after the Asian tsunami, but uh, it's one of the rare cases that I have seen in the country. All type of hazard, meteorological, hydrological, and geological, that tsunami and earthquake, they are in one center, which is not the case. In some cases, the NDMA gets the information from MET service, I think that is the case from other sources. But uh, in Indonesia, the early warning center is multi-hazard center, field test. So people are working at the same time on floods, on earthquakes, tsunami, et cetera, and then the alert is also from one center. That might be another case that you want to look at it, uh, as a reference to the national level. Another one uh, of the data, if I uh, can go to the next slide uh, on, on the Japan. And that's use of drones for impact assessment and real time monitoring. This morning, the use of uh, modern technology was mentioned. So, in, in concrete terms, you, I mean, uh, we are now involved in also Tajikistan and Iran regarding this request. So, we are contacting some other technical bodies how they can design the new technology, modern technology products in such a way that can help with the assessment and also mapping. And there you can see the linkage if you check Japan case between the frameworks policies down to the tools and equipment. That could be a good example how uh, a national data governance or policy model can help uh, to get easy access between actually scientific technology centers and the communities to the operational users in disaster management. That's one example of early warning system, how it can be supported by drones as one of the modern technological products. 
And of course, moldings also, as we look at video, are very well much in that I am. So, on the example that on the sea level, right, as a uh, sort of uh, storm of the disasters, uh, the, the area of the sea level, right, I mentioned a good example, especially in the sector of agriculture sector, and then and the impact on the economy of the people and the country. This has been also looked at in this study that, that uh, we can we are sharing uh, with, with other countries that might be interested. Next, please. On here on the example, actually, the sun does the storm early warning system. Now we are engaged in a project on the impact based. Two more minutes. That's more than enough. <laughs> so, uh, sun does the storm early warning system uh, through impact based forecast. So we're working with the Iran Meteorological Organization. If there is interest, actually, we have facilitated also exchanges. And uh, also here, uh, the Met Service have a very sound understanding, very good, actually, forecast uh, system and ability. But then, through this dialogue, they realize that why not upgrade into the impact-based forecasts? Of course, it's easy to say, but difficult to do. There must be a lot of vulnerability, infrastructure exposure inputs, but the concept is well received. Next one, please. So this is a, a model. I mean, this of course will be shared here. You can look at it. It's not something new. They can, there are many models, but this is one of them. Then you can see the interaction between different elements of creation, development of the data, and then dissemination, the use of it, and then uh, going back to the uh, prevention and the long-term risk reduction in a multi-hazard uh, approach and in a people-centered way. So there are a few recommendations. Uh, the next slide, if I can go. So um, disaster is knowledge, we talked about it. So it will bring all form of knowledge and uh, indigenous to scientific translation to the information can be sent to the population of the is is not only hazard to uh, risk knowledge, but also is Incorporating the indigenous knowledge because at the end of the day it's about humanity and human factors. So this indigenous knowledge is a result of the thousands of years of accumulation of knowledge and skills and experiences. Uh, we, we must be very well aware of it in order to incorporate it. And then detection, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of the hazard of possible consequences and one a solid monitoring network seem to be equipment. We often talk about early warning, but less about monitoring. Okay. That's uh, an issue. Because unless we have a good monitoring capacity and quality, we can't have actually effective early warning as we should. Therefore, uh, the monitoring, I mean, after the initial risk assessment, this is uh, just a model. So we do a long term risk assessment from the SOB. And then, based on the risk assessment, we have the likelihood and impact. This is a simple, uh, actually, matrix that you're aware of. So then this matrix of likelihood impact will tell us four categories, the most important, important, middle, and the lowest. Then we find the hottest spots, and then start the monitoring. So monitoring is a missing thing, almost if a risk assessment very good morning, which requires more attention. And I see here also that that's naturally less uh, attended, I think that uh, can be taken into consideration. A warning dissemination and communication. Remember in tsunami, there was a four hours that on the uh, intelligence Google Point Geneva, and uh, for one week the world didn't know what happened. I mean, we're going to the daily briefing meeting in the UN, but um, there I think uh, the knowledge information was there, but the problem was that it did not reach the people on time. So that was the time that this integrated multi stakeholder holistic approach actually came to the business. The availability of good data is not enough. The dissemination and communication is equally important. And then, actually, technology coming, community based approaches coming, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, in different contexts, solving on seven stores. Uh, preparedness, response capabilities, these are actually the headings of the topics that can be categorized. 
cloud. Uh, sometimes we forget the old data. I think that's a pity that they can help us a lot because the recurrence of the of the hazard and the disasters are based on some cause and effect which can exist forever. So that's actually, uh, especially in a preparedness response area, is forgotten easily because the system is not used to work with the data of the 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, we are just want to be forward looking and we, we have the habit to, to forget. So institutional memory, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, they increase the use of the international available data information. This is a uh, in target, which target of the join? Target in them. Uh, it's about international cooperation support. And it's not only money. So, what I think uh, is more important than money is actually international community support the countries are in need with the technology, with the data information, with the information and transboundary matters. So that's, I think, an area that uh, still, still is very, very, I think, uh, primitive and needs to be developed. And the last slide, leave that to my, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 so I hope I've made it more the time limit. The... Okay, is there any question yes. for Dr. Mohammed? Sure. We can allow one question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are getting borderline four o'clock with the rain and all. Everybody sure, is like, sure, yeah. oh, we have one question, I think, online. Is that a question or is it just a comment? Oh, no, okay, no question. Okay, uh, let me ask uh, Ms. Blackhawk, where did she go? <laughs> Come and provide us with their presentation. That's why I can move it. You just tell me next. Yeah. I'm, I'm acting as a new chair today. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you see your nose? Can you all see your own nose? No, no. No. Can you try it? <laughs> if you try, you can see. If you pay attention to your nose, you can see. But if not, you really can't see, right? So. <laughs> Just an exercise uh, to get your attention. So I hope I can have your attention for the next uh, 10 minutes. I have good news and bad news. I talk a lot, but I also talk very fast. So I hope I can uh, finish within the uh, given time for me. We have heard a lot about data, data for CRR, CCA. So I would also like to offer another perspective on data, but uh, on more localized data, data generated from communities. So what we are calling citizen generated data. And this is a pilot or an experiment that uh, UNDP Maldives Accelerator Lab did, but within the context of the same project, the seeds joint program on uh, strengthening localized DRR and CCA. So uh, we did it this year. And uh, I won't go too much into the climate problems and um, the next slide, uh, I will skip and go to next because I think uh, from since the opening, we are all uh, very much aware of the problem. But uh, when we started this, uh, that was the focus. Uh, uh, we didn't come up with a solution. We started exploring uh, how do we look into the uh, climate problem faced by Maldives. And then uh, try to experiment different methodologies. So from our explorations within the communities, and also very much in the context of this project, we identified uh, two gaps in uh, data mainly. So uh, I think many of you will know that uh, when we have hundreds of islands, uh, each island uh, requires their own 
uh, unique uh, disaster management plans, but many items actually do not have a localized uh, DRR or DRM plan. <coughs> and the two gaps they identified, one was um, lack of localized data, especially georeference data uh, at the island level to enable not just disaster management planning, but risk informed uh, planning for different things that is done by the council. The other gap was the doing that. Uh, Mainly, uh, councils find it very challenging to engage with the community uh, in uh, all the different uh, functions that they have to carry out within the council. So, but mainly around planning and policy. So, next. So, we decided our value proposition uh, had to address these two gaps um, where it also empowers the community, engages the community, but also you know, they fill this data gap. So uh, we wanted to generate accurate your data, but mainly the baseline data, which was very much lacking, uh, that is useful for local planning, uh, but also uh, central policy makers. And engage the community, but also, uh, I think a previous speaker just talked about the three solitudes, right? We also see these solitudes between different layers of governance, local and central, and uh, these two levels don't always talk to each other, uh, even in the digital systems. So also be mindful of this gap. So what we, um, tried, yeah. what, um, from the different methods, we try to test participatory mapping uh, as, a, as a methodology. So participatory mapping, I think it, from the name, it is a bit clear, but I'll try to explain. So when you engage a, a community or a group of people to uh, collect map data. So we tested this in Moon of Mafar uh, as a small experiment. And mainly uh, using open source tools, which I'll um, cover with, uh, in the next few slides. So to generate uh, a more accurate base map, uh, and then use that to develop the island's hazard vulnerabilities and capacities map, which is then used for the uh, disaster management plan, which is the um, process already followed by NDMA, but uh, we thought when you start uh, with a more accurate base map, then the next things that follow uh, will become uh, better quality. So, next. So as part of our collab, uh, so you see two different posters here actually because we did two pilots, but I'll share mainly about the um, buffer pilot. So we had an open call to onboard volunteers uh, from the community, but also in collaboration with the island council. Uh, and you see the delay poster here. So we got a few interested volunteers. Uh, and next, after a short, just uh, one unit, two hours uh, short onboarding and um, training on the tools we will be using. After the training session, next two days, uh, next, we collected uh, the basic map data. So with the volunteers, I think if I remember correctly, it was around 12 and Mapper is not a big island, typical uh, size of a Mali island, I would say around 2,000, 2,900. What am I correct? 1,200. 1,200, okay. So very average uh, size island. So uh, I would also like to mention that uh, here, we also throughout were talking to the team, uh, Prakya and uh, the SCAP team who were developing the land use land cover maps uh, from the satellite imagery, because we wanted to see how we can enhance and add value rather than trying to do something on our own. So um, we had uh, access or they had shared the data they had so far with us. Um, and then within two days actually, so we had a small group, but very enthusiastic group, men, women, older, younger. So it was a, a good mix. And initially we collected uh, the basics, which was the uh, road network and the building footprint. So on open street maps, uh, people just drew the polygons and uh, drew the buildings, combining both satellite imagery as well as uh, street view imagery. So street view imagery was uh, 
I lectured on Mapillary, which is another open source um, um, street imagery application. So <coughs> this was, um, I think, a uh, good way to engage young people as well, because they like to use different uh, tools and applications. Um, and next, sorry, I'm just flipping my, uh, my slides here. <laughs> so Mapillary uh, was one of the tools next. Uh, and then open street maps. Then it took uh, another two days to clean up the data and make it usable uh, on QGIS. Again, just a, a short training where uh, the accelerator lab and the council also participated. So uh, then the base map. So initially, normally you have land use, land cover maps, satellite generated. But when you combine this with the local knowledge, uh, it becomes very rich. So this is only uh, a visualization, but it also has a lot of uh, metadata on not the not only the roads and buildings, but the building condition as well. So you know uh, where the vulnerable buildings are, because in some islands you still see uh, houses built with limestone or coral stone. So when you have those information, it becomes easier to uh, identify the vulnerable communities or uh, vulnerable buildings. So next, next step was hazard uh, vulnerabilities and capacities mapping. Again, uh, very enthusiastic crowd and brings a lot of local knowledge because they know where the flooding happens, which part of the island uh, or the shoreline the erosion happens. So uh, I won't go too much into the process, but the next two, three days. Bashir, no. <laughs> Looks like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so based on this uh, HVC map, the island disaster management plan was done in the next two days. And uh, all of the participants very uh, willingly participated in the disaster management planning workshop. And this again proves the hypothesis when they were part of collecting the data, when they saw uh, collectively the um, risks and hazards faced by them, they were motivated to contribute to the uh, planning process as well. So few learnings to share. Um, this is just a quote uh, from a participant, but for me, I think uh, two key takeaways from this. One was, uh, it was difficult to convene participants. It was also a few weeks before the election, so that was a challenge, but I think uh, those who do participate offer us lessons, but those who cannot participate also of our lessons. It's not that they don't want to, maybe sometimes they can't. So councils also have to see what are the different ways they can uh, engage with different segments of the community. But then other speakers have also talked a lot about like data may be available, but are you actually using them? Are, is there capacity at the national, subnational levels to meaningfully utilize them? So this was another challenge uh, in the plan throughout the disaster management planning process that uh, had, we had to be mindful of that and invite them to trainings and then uh, do it along with them. But this is one island. So in order to scale it to other communities, I think it has to be institutionalized within the processes of NDMA. So where their staff are trained and then when they are doing this with uh, uh, with the councils, they can adopt methodologies like this because it would be beyond uh, ours, beyond the scope of an experiment to scale it uh, nationwide. But the other point was then coordination and integration, coordination between local and national systems. That's why, again, we are still continuing to be in touch with uh, the LAS consultants to see uh, once this data is collected, can it feed into the uh, What's it called? Risk and resilience for yes, I got it. <laughs> because then you are integrating this localized data with national and uh, regional data as well, and it, making it accessible for everybody. So it added adds uh, another layer of detail uh, that could not have been generated from satellite imagery. So um, that would be, I think, the ultimate end of our work, but making sure then this can be replicated uh, by other councils where they are able to uh, use these kind of methodologies, but also feed this data into uh, these systems. Yeah, I think that's it. So just in closing, we did it as part of something we call for the Global Accelerator Hub Lab. 
a work called uh, collective intelligence uh, learning cycle. And uh, just wanted to highlight this point then. Uh, what we call collective intelligence is harnessing the collective intelligence of people and the power of digital technology. So uh, intelligence of people is something I really believe in intelligence of communities, but it becomes more powerful when you also combine it with data and technology. And we need all of that intelligence to solve the uh, crisis and uh, problems we face today. I think we, I have the last slide. Actually, what is this? So, just wanted to thank, uh, I think we have uh, known Mahapur Council President Mohammed Adnan. I just want to acknowledge the support uh, in the pilot. This is a photo of some of the event participants. Later, you can read our blog on this. Also, I will play the short version of the video we did, but it's only two minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the video footage is mainly from our formula uh, experiment, but I share more about the markers. We did it in two minutes. Thank you. Any question for laptop? Yes. yes. So you mentioned uh, you brought in the community with uh, one of the key challenges we have when we work in the community. We often don't get enough. How did you put the intense incentive given to them or was the advertisement over the session really early on? You know, how, how did you, how did yeah, you so that's why we did two experiments, right? Because part of the experiment was also testing this. So with the open call, initially we did not get too many, maybe also because when you say participatory mapping, it's not very clear what, what, what are they going to do, right? Uh, two things that worked, uh, one was, uh, yes, we had the DVD poster as well, and then when they clicked the link, we had information in DVD explaining a bit what is participatory mapping, what are we going to do, and uh, I think the Women Development Committee, the outreach, because they they are very connected within the community, so uh, when they talk to people, tell people, it's easier to onboard them, uh, but council also, uh, reached out to the local NGOs and local institutions. And local institutions then facilitated uh, for them to release uh, staff because if we try daytime, we try the evening time because we also have to consider that uh, there are women uh, who find it difficult during the day or even 
evening. So there's little time that works for everybody. So when we invite both times, what happens is people who work and they don't they want to come, but uh, they they have jobs and they don't have all so the time. So it's done in a weekday. Sir, was it done in a weekday? Yeah. So weekday and weekend and evening. We tested all. <laughs> for weekdays, uh, the, when the council requested the institutions to release them, uh, they did, and they they were able to come and join even though they had a job. Uh, evening work for some, but I think uh, for the second island, for women it was more challenging. Uh, but these, I think, uh, engagement and outreach through the community, like we are, we go to community, we are new, but uh, CSOs, the, the, the women development committees, they have the network. So it's best to engage through them. So we have an initial information to them. Okay, there was some issue with the online version, but because there is a uh, question that uh, was asked but one of the online participants, what's the name of the application used for mapping by the LOPA participants? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I, uh, can you share the slides? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have put two, three slides on and uh, putting the links and a bit of information on the tools. Uh, Babillary is the street imaging. Uh, and we also had the drawn images from uh, council. Uh, so go on. Yeah. And then uh, for buildings and roads and infrastructure mapping, it was uh, open street maps. It's free. Anybody can contribute to uh, maps. And then uh, we don't, uh, you can export these data sets. You can select. Uh, different uh, things you want to download and then use it in uh, GIS applications like QGIS. And good news is now uh, the team has published the QGIS panel, right? Yes, 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 so, yes it's public. Yes. So that is another resource. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was presented in the morning. So whoever that doesn't have laptop can just move one of the computers here. They're all connected. And then you can uh, just open a Google Chrome. And if you, I will give you two questions, two questions, two questions to you. And then if you answer to this question, and then you can close, you can finish, right? <laughs> that's all. That's all. Okay. So, uh, first I'm going to write yes. Uh, the concept of the app is yes. In the morning, I would like uh, I already introduced the time guest. The time guest is uh, the very quick access uh, to for the uh, six basis future climate prediction tools. And then uh, in this training, uh, the, there are several goals and the approach. Minimum goal is uh, yes, please remember Climbcast. Please remember. And then intermediate goal is uh, yes, you can get, really, actually get the climate data from Climbcast. Now, finally, if uh, you will use Climbcast in your work, in your activity, that's the final goal. And I will give you. Some exercise, two two questions, two questions, the double, and then you uh, by using Grimecast, please answer to this question. But that is a very simple and very important question in your climate change related work. And yes, this is step two. Then, but I already introduced that. This is a for, we have a, just two steps to get the uh, future climate data. Step one is the area setting in the from in the top photo. And second step is just quick green photo. That's all. Okay. And that and then you can get the future ground projection by only two steps. Okay. So first question answer temperature increase in your town, in your country. Sorry, 
in your country or in your town. Okay, by using vectors. Okay. <laughs> And you can select the, the period at the end of this century or mid century or near century, near, near town. It's okay. This is the first question. And uh, you can feel by podcast, I allow you to quickly access, quickly get Richard Planet. Change data. Ask question is simple. Only two steps. Only two steps. So if you have finished. Okay. Uh, so one point seven. Uh, the period, what is the period? Uh, it's SSP, uh, the scenario and the period. 51 to 61. 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 51 it's easy, yeah. very easy. So if you need, when you need the data, please ask, just access to get data. Yeah. So this is first question, okay? And the okay. And sometimes uh, you feel that how to make a such kind of a future climate change data, but in a high resolution. So I would like to give you some uh, introduction. Uh, explanation how to get uh, high resolution data. This one is our uh, original global climate data. Okay. And then this one is the downscale data. So which do you need? What was this one? Downscale. Yeah, of, of course this one. And then so some people feel that yes, it is difficult to get this, such kind of downscale data. Yes, of course, of course, but there are several ways to make high resolution data. So actually, so we have a three approaches. First one is a dynamical one. And the dynamical one uh, is used by, uh, is, is made by dynamical model. And the difficulty is difficult, but time consuming. Accuracy, high or low, high or low. Sometimes high, but sometimes low. And the statistical, Another model is the statistical model. By using statistical model, we can make we can make uh, the high resolution data. And difficulty is the intermediate. Time consuming, yes, intermediate. Accuracy, I will know. And another one is uh, just interpolation. Interpolation, interpolation, just like a... And then difficulty, very easy. And time consuming, very high, quickly, quickly. And the accuracy, I think, low, maybe, low. Which is, which do you need? <laughs> so some people, yeah, some people like this one. Because for scientists, some people like this. And then some people like statistical. And some people like this one. And then this separation is like, a, a, as I mentioned in the uh, morning session, this is a French course, this one. Food waste restaurant and then intermediate restaurant and the fast food shop. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which one do you need? <laughs> okay, statistics, of course. But some people, some people like a uh, fast food one, okay? Mm -hmm. Some people like uh, dynamic one. Oh, some days. <laughs> some days, some days. Some days. So, uh, this is the very high cost and the high time consuming. So if you have time, enough time, yes, you can go to the French cost restaurant. But if we do not have time, yes, you can go this way. And prime guess is exactly we use this one, the, uh, the interpolation method. So please understand the, the, the benefit and the advantage and disadvantage of this uh, 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 downscale method. But anyway, that is a, a basic concept of the 
uh, downscaling muscle. And and some people don't, some people think that how to uh, get such kind of downscaling muscle for the interpolation. It's very easy. So there are several uh, interpolation methods. For example, by linear interpolation in bus distant way and so So and most this kind of interpol interpolation method provided in a GIS software. So if you have a QGIS, so by using QGIS, you can downscale theory. Easy. It's not so I, as I said, this is just part of like Marco now working technology. Right. So when you need the downscale data, just use QGIS or open source GIS software, and then you can get downscale data. Not details. Right? We do not think this is difficult. It's very easy okay? by using open source software. And that is a uh, just introduction of the, uh, <clears throat> the downscaling data. And then I give a second question. The second question has a separate two, two part. And the first one is uh, answer how much degree will maximum temperature increase in your town. Okay? Maximum temperature increase in your town. But please uh, look at this one. Period at the end of this century. And also under SSP one two six scenario emission uh, low emission scenario, and by using more climate model you know, this is the Japanese model. And also, please ask the maximum temperature increase at the end of this century. At the end of this century, and SSP three seven zero scenario. Okay, this is the high emission scenario. So please get the two body and the different emission scenario. And then please compare that value. And then that value means the, the effect of mitigation because we compare the different emission scenario, low emission scenario and high emission scenario. And you can get the difference between two scenarios. So that is the effect of mitigation. If you if we cut the emission scenario emission, so we, the maximum temperature will reduce. We can reduce the temperature. So please calculate, please get uh, this value and the different uh, <clears throat> emission scenario. And then please feel, uh, please understand the difference between two emission scenarios in your country. This is the second question. And then final question is uh, like this. Please use different climate model. And then, Previous one is just use different climate emission scenario. The next one is please use different climate model. So please understand that different climate model has a different future climate projection. Future totally different temperature increase projected by a different climate model. So first question is a different emission scenario, and then second question is a different kind of model. Okay, that's all, that's all. If you finish this, if you answer this question, you can go on that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, maybe it's 0.7. Sorry? <laughs> Are you already? You already? 0.7, it's uh, SSP. And then next high emission scenario, is something, okay? And then how, how much difference? Between two emission scenarios. That is the effect of emission uh, mitigation. So if we if you if we can reduce the emission, then we can help. These we can reduce the temperature. Okay. If you feel difficulty, <laughs> difficult or not? You <laughs> see? Yeah, because my daughter can use this. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter is uh, uh, 13 years old. But my daughter can use it. And this is a, a kind of an educational tool. 
Okay. So for tomorrow, again, we are going to be starting uh, the registration at 8.10. And we're going to start our very first session uh, sharp at 8.20. Now, tomorrow is going to be a very interesting session related to early warning for all. Uh, many participants are coming from UNDRR, from uh, basically all of the relevant, uh, or not all, I mean, this is a very kind of a uh, big topic, but NDMA, MS, from the of Agriculture, um, and uh, Red Crescent, and uh, basically it's going to be a very kind of uh, interesting topic and important and relevant for Maldives, especially we can see with all this rain and everything. It, <laughs> it makes you wonder about uh, what are the things that needs to be done. Uh, and that's going to follow by a discussion related to financing in CCA and DRR, which is also a very important topic uh, that is going to be worked on more and more uh, in uh, the basically upcoming uh, initiatives. Uh, and we're going to finish our day tomorrow with one discussion. Uh, related to cooperation, how governmental, non-governmental institutions are able to actually get together as a whole, basically converge their initiatives to uh, make models better, make the work towards uh, CCA and DR more integrate, uh, integrated and uh, basically consistent. Uh, so that's going to be the whole kind of plan for tomorrow, and then hopefully it's going to continue from your side. Uh, while we are supporting from the, uh, you know, back, <laughs> I guess. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, apologies for the extra time. Uh, we are half an hour uh, extra compared to what we're planning. But I think we went through a lot of information today, uh, kind of a bit of uh, basically food for uh, thought. And um, again, there's going to be a restaurant downstairs. Uh, so please help yourself and your way out with some tea and uh, drinks and refreshments, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 10. Oh, yeah, the people that I